Okay, this video is called Advice for Infectious Disease Doctors. So I'm friends with some university infectious disease doctors. And, you know, I like them. They're nice. I see them once in a while. I talk to them once in a while. And I enjoy talking to them, except for one thing. Whenever I try to bring up dormant bacteria and iron, they start acting a little weird. They roll their eyes at me. At first, they act like you don't know what you're talking about. We're the infectious disease doctors. You're just, you know, a stupid neuroradiologist. What would you know about infectious disease? Then they try to change the subject, and I usually add a little bit more. I'm not ready to give up. And then they give me a look to signal that they really want to talk about something else, and they kind of act like the whole thing is a big joke. And I don't see them that often or talk to them that often, but I'll bring it up again, and the whole process repeats itself. And I know that they obviously didn't think it was worth looking up, because every time I see them again, they've never looked it up. You know, so I'm going to introduce it to them in this video. And I think everybody will find this interesting if you care about health and disease, because this is a big subject and it's very useful to know about. I'm also going to start with this slide here to make the point that this is not just me being weird and talking about some esoteric nonsense. This is a major, major, major heavily studied subject. Okay, first of all, I became interested in this from the work of Gregory Sloop talking about blood viscosity and the increased thickness of blood in men compared to women because men have higher hematocrits. Premenopausal women have lower hematocrits because they menstruate. And when you menstruate, you also get more immature red blood cells coming out of the bone marrow because they're younger and they're more deformable. As red cells get older, they get more glycated, plus they get phosphatidylserine, phospholipid in the external uh, face of the plasma membrane of RBCs externalized from inside to outside leaflet of the plasma membrane and it makes them more stiff. So high fat meals uh, accelerate that. Anyways, this guy Randall Lawford, he wrote a great book called Iron in Your Heart. He also wrote another book on iron in your disease. He's a biochemist from Harvard. He's really good. He's brilliant. He's funny. And what I'm trying to show you is I've read all this and quite a bit more on the biochemistry of iron. And I'm telling you, it's a major, major subject and it's fascinating and it's useful to know about. Okay, this book right here by Eugene Weinberg, he wrote a lot about the relationship between iron and cancer and iron and infectious disease. This is a nice handbook of iron overload disorders. This guy, Britton's really bright, wrote some good papers. Um, and this should be something that every medical student learns in biochemistry class, but I can assure you, they know nothing of this. They will know nothing of this. They'll have heard a little bit about iron deficiency anemia, and that's about it. I've never met a single doctor in my life who was conversant about it. And I hadn't even heard about this stuff until Dr. Sloop, I read what he wrote about it. And he only wrote about it from a point of view of causing hypertension. That's why women live longer than men, because they have lower blood pressures before their postmenopausal, because they menstruate every month. It's so a therapeutic phlebotomy. Okay, and these are just more books. This is a good book. Uh, this is a good summary of it. This guy's a real good teacher about hematology and iron metabolism. These two did fantastic. I would consider like Nobel Prize level work. Estheresia Pretorius from South Africa, Douglas Kell from England. They're both PhD scientists. Okay. All right. So, and then there's tons of papers. There's, there's way more than just this. People get interested in eating iron. I ate too much of it when I was younger because everybody has the Popeye story. It makes us think it's going to make us stronger. Okay. Um, now here's what you really want to know about iron. That if you look at an egg, the eggshell's outer surface is permeable to bacteria, but they virtually never get to the yolk. And the reason is the egg white protein has no iron in it. And bacteria need iron to grow. So they can never grow their way to the yolk because they're starved of iron in the egg white. There's even an, you know, an old alternative medicine technique of rubbing egg white in a wound because the lack of iron can help prevent infection. I've never done that, but that's what... That's what the legends say. All right, so anyways, if a man were to walk through the desert, he would have a very difficult time because there's no water. And it's the same thing for bacteria. It can't get through the egg white because there's no iron. And guess what? A cancer is very much like a bacteria. So it doesn't like it when there's a deficiency of iron. And that's why the body hides iron. It sequesters it away. Iron is one of the transitional metals. This is called the D block because it involves the D block orbitals. If you draw out the molecular orbitals where the electrons are, it's a transitional metal because it has a transitional variable valence. It can be plus two or plus three. It can actually have even more valences than that, but those are the main ones that exist in the human body. Fe is for ferrum for iron in Latin, and Fe with a two plus valence or a three plus valence. 
And this variable valence means that electrons can go back and forth as it's oxidized and reduced, and that makes it a great thing to have in the active site of enzymes. So there's lots of metalloenzymes. Plus, of course, it functions in hemoglobin. All right, here's a little bit more about iron. It's right in the center of hemoglobin. When you think about meat, right in the center of hemoglobin, you've got, or in myoglobin, you've got this iron <clears throat> coordinated to the nitrogens of the heme uh, protoporphyrin ring. And so meat means iron. All right, when you think about a plant, you've got magnesium in the center. So just think about that. Iron, we're overloaded and it's dangerous. Magnesium, it's good and we're deficient of it, most people. And it's right in the center of chlorophyll. So here's a little more true to life drawing of iron in the center of hemoglobin and doing its job, binding with oxygen in a releasable manner. It's also bound to histidine. So you can see right here, iron is coordinating six bonds to so the four nitrogens, number five to the oxygen, number six to the histidine. So that's all the interactions that iron can have. It's a very uh, complex, sophisticated molecule. And that's why it's so useful for hemoglobin and for a lot of metalloenzymes, like all the cytochrome enzymes in the liver for detoxification, cytochrome P450, for example. Now here is a graph of iron total body storage. Total body storage of iron on this axis going up, and then the person's age over here. So up until about 20, we're growing so fast, we, you know, sort of playing catch up with our iron. Um, especially young women, when they first hit puberty, they're growing fast and they're menstruating all of a sudden, so they will be the ones a little bit prone to being iron deficient. Anyways, men start becoming iron overloaded once they hit maturity, you know, let's say around 20 years of age. And in countries where they eat a lot of meat, like America, they become iron overloaded, progressively worsening in that aspect. Women tend to keep their iron down pretty well up until they hit menopause, and then they start having a steep upward slope of iron accumulation, just like the men do, and they start catching up with the men in disease. Okay, if you're wondering when am I going to get to the infection stuff, I'm going to get to it in just a moment, but i got to give you this intro to iron so it'll all make sense. Here is the mitochondria, and here's the outer mitochondrial membrane, the inner mitochondrial membrane. This is where electron transport occurs. Like a fireman's bucket brigade, they pass the electrons down to progressively more aggressive grabbers of iron. And oxygen is the ultimate electron acceptor. It has a very high electronegativity, meaning that it really wants to grab the electrons, more powerful than all the stuff that comes before it. And when that happens, it gets converted to water. Okay, but once in a while, an electron will leak off the transport chain. It'll interact with oxygen within the mitochondrial matrix in the center of the mitochondria, and that'll produce a free radical called superoxide. Free radical is when you have an unpaired electron in the outer orbital, so it's highly, highly reactive. The body's used to occasional uh, superoxide free radicals occurring. Sometimes they'll call them oxy radicals within the mitochondria. And there's an enzyme to quench that called SOD, superoxide dismutase. It works really well to quench the, the free radicals when they come along. The only problem is if you have an excessive amount of iron, iron overload in the body, sometimes you can get a reaction with the oxygen the superoxides and the other molecules related to that, like hydrogen peroxide, called the Fenton reaction. Fenton reaction, the name is easy to remember, because just remember Fe for iron, and Fe is the two letters in Fenton. And that will produce hydroxyl radicals, which are very difficult for the body to interact with. That's like bouncing a super ball in a glass china shop, and it just breaks into things, bounces into things, and starts breaking things. And it'll especially trash the mitochondrial membrane, but it can also trash DNA. It'll trash whatever it bumps into can do a lot of damage. So that's why free iron, it's never supposed to be free. The body always wants to keep iron bound to something because when iron is free, it's dangerous. It'll, it'll undergo these autocatalytic reactions where it just gives electrons uh, to molecules that it shouldn't and they become like uh, hydroxyl radicals and damaged tissue. And this is called oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is when the oxidants, things like free iron, are greater than the antioxidants, things like vitamin C and vitamin E, for example, and glutathione and whatnot. Okay, so here's one thing. You can get an estimate of your total body iron storage by measuring your, your ferrum levels in your blood, serum ferritin. Ferritin is a storage protein for iron. And so the point is, the higher your serum ferritin level, the sooner you die, in general. Um, these are molecules right here, 8-hydroxyguanosine, that are indicators in the urine of how much free iron you have in your body, causing problems, oxidative stress, okay? Okay, now here's where it's gonna start getting a little more interesting from an infectious disease point of view. 
First of all, I'm going to talk about the effect of iron, and then I'm going to talk about the amplified effect of iron. A normal red blood cell is discoid, so it has a, a little indented area here in the center. Um, it's about 7 microns in length, which is just a little bit bigger than a capillary. Capillary is in general about 5 microns. Here is some thrombin or fibrinogen. Let's say this is the fibrinogen. It looks like a piece of spaghetti. It has a nice linear spaghetti-like shape. Okay, and the RBCs are relatively round. They've got a central bare area. That's all normal. These are normal RBCs. However, when they interact with excessive free iron, it causes oxidative stress, which distorts like maybe lipid peroxidation of the outer leaflet of the membrane of the red blood cell, and it will distort the shape of the red blood cell. Here's a red blood cell shaped like a teardrop. It will also distort the shape of the fibrinogen, the blood clotting protein. Normally, the fibrinogen, like we said, is like a piece of spaghetti. Whereas here, you start getting these matted uh, things that can almost precipitate out of solution. You get these abnormal, highly irregular uh, clotting patterns. And this is called amyloidosis. I'll explain to you in just a moment what amyloidosis means, but it's a bad thing. The body has to be able to turn clotting on and off, almost like flipping a light switch on and off. And when you form these abnormally uh, complex matted clots, it's harder for the body to dissolve those. So the blockage of a artery, artery might be irreversible because it's harder to dissolve this. Okay, so here's just another picture that summarizes what's happening with the iron. The iron is cycling back and forth from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, and that is called ferrous redox cycling. So here it is written out, ferrous redox cycling. And that is bad because while it's doing that, it's giving off electrons to the oxygen and it's going to lead to the production of these hydroxyl radicals that just quickly bind to things and destroy them. Hydroxyl radicals will bind to uh, the plasma membranes and cause lipid peroxidation of the membranes to DNA and cause DNA damage. So you don't want that. And this guy, Eugene Weiberg, came up with a great metaphor for iron. He says it's like a fire. You want fire in your fireplace to warm the house. You want it in your furnace to warm your house. You want it in your stove to cook your food. But you don't want it anywhere else because if you do it anywhere else, it burns things down. It damages things. So iron, just like fire, is useful when it's in the right place, but it's very bad when it's in the wrong place. This painting is called Burning City by Egbert van der Poel. Nice painting. Okay, iron is absorbed into the body. We only take in, uh, we only, let's say we absorb about 10%. So we take in about 10 times these amounts. Uh, a typical man will excrete only about one milligram per day. That's almost nothing. A woman, if she's menstruating, she excretes a net amount of about, comes out to about two milligrams per day. So control of iron is based on absorption patterns. We really don't have a good way to get rid of it. And the reason for that is because we're not made to eat meat. We're not made to take in so much iron. But in the modern world, we become overloaded in it. Um, the majority of iron goes to your red blood cells to function in your hemoglobin. A lot of it's tied up in your spleen in the macrophages, the sort of uh, cells that recycle the red blood cells in the spleen. A lot is stored in the liver, and a lot's in the muscles in the form of myoglobin, which is like hemoglobin. It just binds to iron, keeps a little extra oxygen around for you know bursts of exercise. Okay, it's so absorbed from the gut. The iron comes into the gut lining cells, the enterocytes. The gut's called the enteric tract, so the lining cells are enterocytes. Any cell that lines a lumen, an open uh, structure, is also called an epithelial cell. So you sometimes hear them called intestinal epithelial cells. Yeah, like right here they write intestinal epithelium. And the iron is absorbed from the gut into the enterocyte, and then it's released into the blood. This little cell it's released to is called ferroportin. Ferro for iron, portin for door. So that's the iron door. And we actually have something called hepcidin, which blocks the iron door when we want to reduce absorption. Okay, now here's a very nice diagram. And the guy who does the best version of this guy, Vernon Louvre. Vernon Louvre is a hematologist. He's a brilliant guy. He's a great teacher. And he's an expert on iron. So if you really want to learn about iron metabolism and red blood cells and all this other stuff related to that, he's a good guy to learn from. Okay, now the iron comes in. We ingest it. It goes into the enterocyte. Um, and then through the ferroportin, it can be blocked by hepcidin. Hep is from liver. Cidin means to kill bacteria because you kill bacteria by not allowing uh, iron into the blood. 
or it can go through the Fairport and door when it's open into this little boat, like a kayak that carries two passengers, two molecules of iron. It's also been called a wheelbarrow. Uh, but anyways, the tra and this is transferrin. Transferrin is the transport protein for iron in the blood. And it'll transport iron around to wherever it needs to go, to the bone marrow to make red blood cells, to the liver for storage, or to the muscle for myoglobin. And in 120 days, uh, the red blood cells are recycled. Basically, they lose their flexibility and you know, normal capillary, five microns, RBC, seven microns. So it's a challenge for them to get through that. The spleen is like three micron diameter capillaries, sinusoids, you might call them. And the glycated old RBCs at about 120 days, they can't get through that. They just break apart. They lice. And then the macrophages, just like Pac-Man, will just suck up the iron and they'll store it until it's needed for some later purpose. Okay, so this is just showing hepcidin comes from the liver. It's one of the acute phase reactant proteins. And again, when the body has excessive iron, doesn't need any more, hepcidin will block it from coming in. It'll block ferroportin. Like here's the gut, here's ferroportin. Hepcidin will block this. Also, if there's an infection in the body, the body will want to reduce the amount of iron in the blood. So it'll also block the ferroportin absorption iron door coming out of the gut. Okay. Trust me, I'm getting to something very interesting and relevant to infection. I just got to do all this intro stuff so it all makes sense. A lot of grains are iron fortified, mean iron enriched. Iron is added to them nowadays, so they could have more than four times as much. They could have even far more than that. And so you got to be careful about eating that stuff because you can get yourself iron overloaded with it. Okay, a little bit about a peripheral smear of blood. Here's a red blood cell, again, about seven microns in diameter. That's the central bare area or central pallor. It's usually about a little less than one third the diameter of the red blood cell. Here's a lymphocyte, and typically the nucleus of a lymphocyte will be about the same size as an RBC. I realize this lymphocyte has slightly bigger nucleus, so they should have got a better picture. It's from this paper right here. They should have got a better paper. They should have had a nucleus a little smaller in their lymphocyte, because usually that's a pretty good metaphor. Okay, here's a normal red blood cell. Here's IDA for iron deficiency anemia. Small RBCs called microcytic, and then there's a lack of hemoglobin in them, so they're called hypochromic, okay? Because you don't have the iron, you can't make enough hemoglobin, and you see a larger central pallor, or a larger bare area. With B12 deficiency, you get big RBCs, okay? With high fat meal, you get these spur cells, asymmetric spurring, acanthocyte, E for equal, uh, equal spurring here, a kinocyte, also called a burr cell. Here's the teardrop cells with excess iron when that happens. And we're going to also see when there's excess bacterial LPS, lipopolysaccharide endotoxin, or from gram-negative bacteria, or uh, lipotychoic acid from gram-positive bacteria. It's their endotoxin equivalent. You'll get distortion of shape like these teardrop cells and these other types of fragmented or distorted red blood cells, as we're going to soon see. Okay, a single high-fat meal causes, yeah, I already kind of told you about that, uh, the acanthocytes and the echinocyte. So here's acanthocyte, A for asymmetric, asymmetric spurring, E for echinocyte, equidistant spurring. I also remember echinocyte, echino, an echinid is like a, a porcupine or a hedgehog with, with like the spurs on himself. So uniformly spaced is echinocyte. Okay. And that's from a high fat meal. So the point I'm making is what you eat can distort the shape of your red blood cells. Again, a normal red blood cell is beautiful, symmetric, round with the central discoid area. And here's a distorted red blood cell when iron is added to the, 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 the slide material, all right? Getting to be like a teardrop. And here it is distorting the fibrinogen, making these dense matted deposits. So these two, she does a lot of the hematology type work. He does a lot of the microbiology and biochemistry work. And they paired up together to do brilliant work on the relationship between dormant bacteria, red blood cells, and excess of iron and as well as leaky gut. One thing you want to know is you want to know that a normal serum ferritin, trust me, this is a very important number to know, should be less than 100 and probably really about 25 to 80. You should know that number. Normal serum ferritin should be about 25 to 80. A lot of researchers spent a long time trying to figure that out. That's worth knowing. And that's about where you would expect a, you know, a premenopausal woman to be. And that ends up being where all everybody should pretty much be. Humans normally and our ancestors eating all these plant foods, they didn't have that much iron absorption. So iron was a bit of a scarce commodity. So the body got good at hanging on to it, to conserve it, to save it. You also want normal transferrin saturation about 25 to 35%. Think of it as usually being about one third, 33%. And the reason is if you get above that, it's an indicator of your iron overload, especially when you start getting up over 50 or 60, especially over 60. But just remember this one too, normal transferrin saturation 
is about one third, 33%. And then different people will give you wider or tighter ranges. But know that it's usually about one third, 33% of them are those transferring little kayak iron carrying sites in the blood are filled with an actual iron molecule. And the way people run into trouble as they get older, for example, in diabetes, when they start glycating proteins like they glycate hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C, they'll also glycate transferrin and ferritin, and then they'll start leaking iron, and they'll have more free iron running all these autocatalytic reactions of oxidative stress. Oh, here's just a painting of what's called love sickness of virgins. So they used to call iron deficiency anemia the love sickness of virgins, because that's when girls would get it. They would go into puberty, they start growing fast, and they start menstruating. So simultaneously needing more iron and losing more iron, and then they would become anemic, okay? Okay, what causes iron overload? We're not gonna get into that right now. There's a lot of things that cause it. Um, it's associated with increased risk of heart disease. Again, we're not gonna get into all that. Our focus for this talk is infectious disease, but here is this guy, uh, Leo Zacharski, and he did a lot of great research to figure out that normal serum ferritin should be 25 to 80. That's very important to know, normal serum ferritin 25 to 80, because if you're going to donate blood or just restrict your diet to try to lower your serum ferritin levels to, get, to reduce your total body iron stores, you need to know what your goal is. And your goal should be to get into this, you know, this is the, the ideal zone between 25 to 80, okay? And the reason you want to do that is if you can get into that zone, you lower your risk of cancer, you lower your risk of diabetes, you lower your risk of uh, atherosclerosis, of dementia. Okay, so here is a normal uh, glucose molecule, and here it is with a closed chain configuration. Here it is with an open chain configuration. Normally, it'll cycle back and forth between what's called the alpha version of the cyclic form of glucose or the beta version of cyclic glucose. And it goes to the closed form. It'll open up and it'll go to the other version of itself. And when it's open during this brief moment, it can then bind to proteins and glycate them. So it's a sugar glyc, and to bind to uh, things is called glycation. So here was a glucose in the open configuration binding to a side chain of a protein, let's say a lysine, the nitrogen on a lysine, and now it'll form a fixed irreversible bond there. So like here's hemoglobin A1C and it stiffens the, the hemoglobin, stiffens the red blood cell. It'll also stiffen collagen and damage whatever it binds to. This is just a little fancier explanation of what advanced glycation end products are all about. I go into much more detail about that in my diabetes lecture. But the, the main point to know is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme is blocked. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate accumulates, it makes MGO, methyl glyoxyl, and that goes around glycating stuff inside the cell, it exits into the blood, the extracellular matrix, and in the blood, and so it starts glycating things randomly and making them dysfunctional and stiff. Okay, so here's one of the points of this whole lecture is that <clears throat> when you get more of this glycation, let's say diabetes from hyperglycemia, glycating hemoglobin and other things, glycating transferrin, TF is for transferrin, that will then um, <clears throat> cause a leakage of iron from the transferrin. So you'll get more NTBI, that's non-transferrin bound iron in the blood, and that's going to start damaging your red blood cells. Okay, It's also being free and available. It's going to cause reactivation of dormant bacteria. And we'll talk about that in just a moment, but that's an important thing to know. you got dormant bacteria in your blood, and it's pretty obvious. We, everybody knows that tuberculosis can sit dormant in your body for years and then be reactivated. Everybody knows syphilis can sit dormant in your body for years and be reactivated. Everybody knows that um, Lyme disease can be dormant for years and be reactivated. Everybody knows that herpes simplex, genital and you know perioral, that can be reactivated, okay? So this is not some obscure mystery. It's well known. And guess what? Those are just the famous diseases. There's a whole bunch of other bacteria that can be reactivated by excessive free iron becoming available. And also, when so we'll, we'll cover it. We'll leave it at that point. When, when you have less ability of transferring to hang on to the iron, you then have more iron free in the blood and you're susceptible to a bunch of bacteria. So you're immunosuppressed, relatively speaking. Okay, we talked about how when you've got chronic diabetes, you get thickening of the capillary basement membrane. Here it's normal thin, here it's thick, and so less oxygen can get from the red blood cells to the tissue. That's a relevant point, so that's going to increase your risk of cancer. Less oxygen you get to the brain, the hippocampus is a memory center, increasing your risk of dementia. 
simultaneous with diabetic insulin resistance, less glucose taken up into the hippocampal neurons because you don't have glucose type 4 transporters. I know I'm kind of rattling through a little bit of complex stuff. I'm going to go, th I've already gone through all this in other lectures, and I'm going to go through it more in future lectures. This focus of this talk is on the infectious stuff, but I'm, I'm making a point that this out of control iron is contributing to dementia. So I won't go through all the diabetic dementia stuff. What I really wanted to show was a cancer cell. So here's a cancer cell. A cancer cell can have 1,000 times more um, iron uptake receptors on its plasma membrane. These will be in the form of transferrin receptors for the transferrin iron transport protein in the blood that will then uh, come and bind with them, okay? So the point I'm saying is a cancer cell is like a vacuum to suck up iron. So if you've got cancer, you want to minimize your bodily iron. And why is that a big deal? Because like I said, the cancer cell is like a bacteria, similar to an anaerobic bacteria. It needs iron to grow. And restricting iron can be a beneficial strategy for a cancer patient to try to improve their prognosis. All right, and it's also a beneficial thing to preventing infections. So that's why infectious disease docs should know about it. And now we're getting into the really big topic. Here's a typical fibrinogen protein in the blood. And it normally has this, like a slinky, a loop to loop cylindrical alpha helix uh, structure. So the alpha helix is like considered a secondary component of protein structure. And the hydrogen bonds are within the molecule itself. So that's intra, I N T R A A A, intra molecular hydrogen bonds. And they hold it tightly into cylindrical configuration. And that's called alpha helix. All right, so what happens? When you have excessive free iron, oxidative stress, will distort its shape and make it more like a bunch of paper, pieces of flat paper that can stack up on itself. Beta pleated sheets is another major secondary protein structure configuration. Those are the two big ones, alpha helix and beta pleated sheet for a protein secondary structure. And now the hydrogen bonds are not within the same molecule. They're not intra, they're inter, I-N-T-E-R, I-N-T-E-R. And they, they bind them together into a big stack. And the more... Um, protein molecules that are aggregated together, the more likely they're going to precipitate out of solution, become solid. Proteins are only functional when they're soluble in the aqueous phase, the liquid water-like phase of the cytoplasm in the blood. If they precipitate out, then they're dysfunctional and they can get really big as more and more beta pleated sheet distorted pieces of fibrinogen stick to each other. Trust me, this is a big deal to know. And that's what amyloidosis is. It's distortion of the shape of a protein moving from an alpha helix configuration to a beta pleated sheet configuration whereby it'll stack up together and now it can cause, have damaging mass effect, come out of solution and be dysfunctional, can cause all sorts of problems. And then how does LPS get into the blood? LPS is lipopolysaccharide. It's the gram-negative endotoxin and it gets into the blood when you've got leaky gut. So leaky gut is now becoming part of a problem with bacterial infection in the blood. So you need to know that. And this is how these things all start adding together. Leaky gut also can, you know, like I said, let endotoxin in. Sometimes entire bacteria can get through big gaps in the gut or through in your mouth. You got leaky gums, poor dentition, okay? So this is a real important point. You really want to understand this. Alpha helix, intramolecular hydrogen bonds, disruption of protein structure like by LPS, lipopolysaccharide from gram-negative bacteria, or excessive free iron, from eating too much meat or other high iron sources in the diet, or LTA, I forgot to write LTA in here, lipotychoic acid, which is the gram-positive bacteria version of an endotoxin. It's the equivalent, essentially, of LPS. It's actually even more potent than LPS for this purpose. And that'll cause amyloidosis of your fibrinogen protein in the blood. So again, here's leaky gut. Um, they're gonna call dysbiosis having the wrong bacteria in your gut because you don't eat enough fiber. And then the bacteria getting in the blood, atopobiosis is just like saying ectopic, abnormally located bacteria. They're not supposed to be in the blood. And like I said, they can get through your gums too if you don't have good, take good care of your mouth, your teeth. Here's just an electron micrograph showing bacteria in the blood. And by the way, this is super common. If you haven't heard of it, it's just because you haven't read the papers. Uh, there's tons of papers on this. All right, amyloidosis of a protein. We talked about it switching from alpha helices into beta pleated sheets, flat sheets, stacking up. Um, so here again is a teardrop-shaped red blood cell, and again, this can be from LPS or from excessive serum ferritin. Um, here's the abnormal matted, dense matted deposit type clots that are more resistant to dissolving. Here's another one of the many papers by Douglas Kell and Ethelresia Pretorius on this subject. Amyloidogenic blood clotting amplification, in this case by LPS. 
gram negative bacteria endotoxin. So here it is, LPS binds to fibrinogen, causes abnormal shaped clot, okay? And it's more difficult to lyse. And it increases the tendency to clot against prothrombotic. And here is a beautiful study they did together. Again, Douglas Kell with Etheresia Pretorius, okay? So the last guy runs the lab, let's say in this case, and the first person is the one who did the most work on the paper. And then these are all their partners that help work with them, their lab assistants, their PhD students and whatnot. And what they did was they showed, here's a control, you, you use a stain like a versions of, you know, Congo Red stains real effectively for amyloid. And there's different variations on that stain. But here's what they're showing. Normal blood, you don't got any of this Congo Red equivalent type stain or Congo Green. But when you put LPS into the mixture, boom, it becomes amyloid. You add excess iron to it, free iron, boom, it becomes amyloidogenic, it distorts the shape. You add LTA, this is the gram uh, positive bacteria endotoxin, lipotychoic acid, boom. You get all the different color versions of these amyloid stains. So as I said, this is like, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. It's beautiful. I mean, this is a magnificent experiment. Okay, this is, this is Nobel Prize quality work. These guys have showed a major mechanism of increasing the tendency of blood to clot. The reason that's such a big deal is that's why people die. People die when an artery in their heart is plugged up. That's a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. People die or at least are severely debilitated when they have a big stroke. An artery in their brain is plugged up and then the brain tissue can't get enough oxygen and it dies. It's a cerebral infarct, a stroke. Okay, and these guys show that a major contributor to it is leaky gut as well as excessive dietary iron leading to bodily iron overload, leading to excess free iron subsequently eventually becoming available in the blood and within cells. So this is really magnificent work. It's, it's Nobel Prize quality work. And then the, the big precipitates of the amyloidogenic fibrinogen and also amyloidogenic like beta amyloid protein from the brain they can have mass effect in other cells. Now I'm talking about Alzheimer's dementia. Let's just call it dementia, but these oligomers or even bigger precipitates of beta amyloid protein along neurons, they can distort the plasma membrane of a neuron and that can open up the glutamate receptor, also called the NMDA receptor, and then cause excessive entry of calcium into the cell and excessive activation of the cell. So that's excitotoxicity. And that's why MSG, uh, glutamate, monosodium glutamate can be excitotoxin, and that's why um, things that cause this amyloidogenesis uh, effect can. And so here, here's sort of like you might call this, if you went to the fireworks or the grand finale, running the show by Douglas Kell and Etheresia Pretorius, leaky gut and leaky gums, okay, allowing dormant blood bacteria into the blood and LPS and LTA, causing uh, eventual free iron also becoming available because of high dietary iron and other problems leading to increased dietary iron, causing reactivation of these dormant bacteria. Normally, they'll just hang out waiting for iron to become available in the blood. Once that becomes available, they'll cause the blood to clot, and this iron dysregulation will cause oxidative uh, stress. And this combination increases atherosclerosis, increases brain hypoxia, and the death of brain cells, as well as the clotting, plugging up arteries, will increase the risk of the death of brain cells. All right, so the point I'm saying is this goes on day after day when a person keeps on eating and living in a way that causes leaky gut as well as iron accumulation. And so they end up with progressively losing more and more brain cells. So this is a rather beautiful explanation of a contributing mechanism to brain damage, loss of brain neurons, and becoming demented. And so we're not going to get into this too much today, but reducing your dietary intake of iron helps, and you can consider donating blood. So I just wanted the infectious disease doctors to know this topic exists so they could read more about it, and I think that'll be interesting to them, and I think they'll help their patients, so I hope that was helpful.